Hey everybody and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am very excited to present to you today my second interview with Fee.org's Sean Malone. Fee is, of course, the foundation for economic education, which is something that I've taken a great interest in as a filmmaker because anybody who wants to become a filmmaker should understand business and economics to a certain degree if they're going to be able to navigate all the bookkeeping and, and business decisions that will lead to them being able to continue to create uh, because you cannot create without some form of success to sustain that. Anyway, Sean has a very interesting show on the Fee YouTube channel called Out of Frame, where he presents to you different movies or television shows, explains the story in context of economics and how these shows demonstrate different economic theories or ways of thinking. Uh, I've learned a lot from them and I think that they are worth seeing, worth watching. So I wanted to have Sean on here to discuss today certain aspects of entertainment economics, including the potential IOTSE strike, or maybe it's not going to happen, we don't know, and what the ramifications of that will be if the union gets their way or the studio gets their way or what kind of compromises or meeting in the middle will be beneficial to all. Anyway, like I said, this was a very productive and exciting interview for me. I was very excited to have Sean on the show. So without further ado, let's check it out. Welcome everybody, this is Christopher Moonlight and I am honored to once again have Out of Frames, Sean Malone on the show with me. Welcome Sean, uh, thanks for being on. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. It's it's good to be back. It's been a bit. It has been. And uh, I have said before, I'm a big fan of your channel. Um, I do read fee.org articles because as a filmmaker, I also want to be a better business person because I want this to be economically viable for <laughs> me as I produce more movies, um, which film, it's a difficult thing to do. It is absolutely um, not... In, uh, the best investment. Uh, if you are more interested in making money, there are easier ways to do that. But if you're passionate about film and you want to see yeah. a return and you want to make more films, uh, it does help to know about business. And I've seen a lot of my filmmaker friends not take an interest in business and it's hurt them. So um, you are kind of a big part of my, my uh, self-teaching business school. And uh, cool. so I, I very much appreciate fee.org. I love Out of Frame, your most recent episode, uh, everything you really need to know about Dune yeah. uh, was brilliant. And I'm looking forward to the new Dune movie. I am a fan of the old Dune movie. I know it's weird. <laughs> I just you know, David it's uh, it's it's fun. It's such a weird movie, first of all, that the, the David Lynch's Dune, but it is. And I will, I will give it this like it is pretty true to the book. Like it is not um, that far off. I think where it goes awry is is just probably mostly studio meddling, right? Because it they just they condensed so much, and things get you know turned into montages or or narration. But I think part of the thing was just so weird about that movie was just all of the internal monologues that are happening with everybody just sort of staring to camera and. I, I honestly think, I know Villeneuve is very, very good as a visual director and, and every single one of his movies has been just gorgeous in my opinion, particularly Blade Runner. But I mean, obviously Arrival was, was also uh, just a beautiful, beautiful movie. And I think like just that plus not doing internal monologue the entire <laughs> time would probably be enough for me to make it a, a, a pretty exciting movie. But um, yeah, that's... Uh, comes up for me anyway I'm, I'm not going to get to see it um probably until friday night maybe saturday um i'm doing a live stream uh on friday but it's just about out um in the united states i'm kind of bummed out that that movie has not come out in the u.s already and made it to europe and most of the rest of the world first which was kind of a weird twist on <laughs> on uh you know premieres but well, um, it's it, 
that that form of sci-fi it does have kind of a uh a, um, or even though frank herbert isn't european it has like a european flair to it in a way it yeah. kind of yeah. meshes with like the mobius aesthetic and and the you know mm-hmm. jodorowsky of course is oh yeah uh, infamously involved in it and you know if, it, yeah. if david lynch got his way you get people staring off into camera, but you just wouldn't get the monologue. You'd be worrying. I love it's David true. Lynch. It's and that's true. probably why I love the movie, you know, is because it's so Lynchian anyway, despite the fact that it, it you're right, it doesn't work as a movie, but it's, it's still entertaining to watch. Yeah. And your take on it, um, and by the way, but you mentioned you're doing a live stream. That's with Eric July. Yeah. And, that is going to be, uh, hopefully this video will be out before then. So anybody watching this can go check that out as well. But you're going yeah. to be covering a lot of the same topics we're going to be talking about today. Probably, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard to avoid with Eric. I, I, I love talking to Eric, but like, you know, we'll, we'll definitely be getting into the state of Hollywood and, and you know, stuff like that. But um, yeah, anyway, that's, yeah, that's happening uh, Friday the 22nd. And if, if anybody did miss it, I mean, obviously it'll still be on the YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch it. Is that going to be on the Out of Frame or the Out of Frame podcast? It'll be on the main channel. So it'll be on, on the Out of Frame channel. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm kind of curious about, this is kind of a test, actually. I kind of want to do uh, more of that kind of thing. Um, so we'll see. We'll see how it yeah. goes. And today can be the test for the test. Um, I'm obviously not as famous as uh, Eric, uh, but at the same time, uh, like I said, today, as people may guess from the, the title of this video, I want to dis- discuss the IATSE potential strike. Now, um, that's the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees, um, which I have in my notes off camera. And I've taken a lot of notes today because This is a subject, usually I can shoot from the hip, but this is a subject that I'm still learning about. So I've taken a lot of notes and I've got a lot of questions um, pertaining to essentially what I'm going to do is run by how I perceive what I'm seeing, uh, not just with IOTC, but the industry in general. And because you have such experience and and knowledge of economics and how they apply to things like entertainment, because you are um, a trained musician and you've, of course, uh, worked with nonprofits and you have your own um, citizen a media uh, so you know a lot about this stuff so I want to see what I may have what I'm perceiving am I getting it right where am I getting it wrong and uh, maybe you can uh, help me kind of visualize something that as an independent filmmaker I can use to uh, further my own company and anybody else who's an independent filmmaker paying attention could also find that useful um well and i want to say real quick for everybody as well i i do not pretend to be an expert on the union uh negotiation process or or how any of that's gone i i've read probably the same variety articles that everybody else has at this point so i don't know the ins and outs of 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 uh that necessarily but i mean i certainly like you know, I've thought a lot about the role that unions can play versus, you know, um, the way that people think about entrepreneurship, even as an independent contractor and and things like that for a long time. And I've spent a lot of time uh, looking at the way rules shape, uh, you know, actual actual laws, right? But also institutional rules shape people's behavior. So that's, you know, hopefully I think we can have a pretty robust conversation about a lot of this stuff. I'm also fascinated by you know, even coming up as a composer and working in Hollywood, you know, there is no composers union, right? So um, it's always been a little bit interesting to me to have a foot in the composing world, but then also seeing all of my friends who were, you know, electricians, grips, cinematographers, actors, you know, and every one of them has a guild, you know, type of union. And then with IATSE, like that's like an amalgamated union of unions, right? So it's like a whole <laughs> bunch of unions coming together because their individual unions didn't totally serve them as well, which I think is kind of fascinating. It's, it's like you would think that your, you know, your, your local uh, whatever 415 is going to do enough to get you the, the pay and the time off and the benefits and all that kind of stuff. But even that doesn't seem to be sufficient. So people, you know, kind of leveled up to having this broader union that that encompasses even more 
you know, individual groups who all theoretically could be joining separate unions. I don't know. It's it's all kind of fascinating to me. So I think it should be a should be pretty fun topic. Yeah, well, it, it's what's interesting to me when you say that, too, is, is yes, there have been other strikes. And I've I know a lot of people in the entertainment inter industry who after the negotiations are over, um, they go back to work and they're telling me about their their work hours and conditions. And I'm like, what did the union even do for you? Who, who benefited from this? Yeah. And that that's a question, you know, sometimes, uh, again, without naming names or unions or shows or anything like that, because I don't want to get anybody in trouble. But there's one person I know that worked on a very uh, famous game show as a, a camera person. And uh, after they went back to work, it was still like, if you take any sick time off, you're fired. You know, you got to work these insane hours like this guy was working seven days a week, not seeing his family uh, for ages, working through yeah. being sick. And I'm like, what? Why are you even doing this again? I, <laughs> I'm I, I'm surprised. I mean, I, so one of the things that I've thought about for a long time and 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 people have asked me about because for for those who don't haven't seen out of frame, a lot of a lot of what I talk about is is you know economic freedom and i talk about um you know different political philosophy and economics and and things of that nature as it as it sort of applies to pop culture and and drawing it out of movies and tv shows and whatnot and and um one of the things that i i wanted to do even before long before i started that series like i had this idea, idea to do what became an out of frame episode called the the idea i had was called it's just business and I think the episode is called Hollywood's favorite trope, something like that. And yeah, and and, um, and it's this this idea of this like evil businessman, right? Like it's a businessman who's also a murderer, or, or you know goes and and you know poisons the water supply for a whole town, or you know infects people with diseases, or gives people cancer, all all of these kinds of things. And, and then twirls and his mustache all, and cackles. And exactly right, and, and then literally says quite often, "Well, it's not personal; it's just business." blam blam i've murdered you right like that's sort of the idea that you see all this all the time and it and it really is a trope and it's so ultimately it's actually boring to me from a, a aesthetic point of view because i've seen it so much that you did it's, another video about uh where you're featuring john carpenter's they live where it's yeah, uh, yeah. um it's the again they said just that like it's just business i thought you boys understood that you know right. and and, and uh, it's always, I mean, and I, I even, it's like, I, I wanted to do this for ages because like, I just had a, I just had a super cut in my mind, which, which is in the, the Hollywood's favorite trope episode. I had the super cut of just in my head of like all of these different movies and TV shows where exactly that line or something very, very close to it is uttered. We just play them back to back and you see it. But one of the things that people have always asked me is like, well, why do people in Hollywood hate business so much? And I honestly think that a piece of the reason, I don't think this is the only reason there's, there's, and this is probably not, you know, this is a whole other tangent we don't have to talk about on this show. But like, I do think one of the reasons is that in Hollywood specifically, the condi working conditions are terrible and they've been terrible as, as as far as I'm aware, pretty much since the beginning for a lot of people, you know, Hollywood's an industry where there are some very, there's a very tiny percentage of people who do extremely well. And then there are it, it just hundreds or thousands upon thousands of people who make a living, but don't make a very good living and have a very hard existence making a living. They have long work hours, they have you know, tough bosses, they have, you know, people who believe in their creative vision so much that they're allowing it to, you know, to, they believe, they feel justified in, in treating people horribly, right? They feel justified in, in running, bulldozing people and saying, well, you know, you've got to work until 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or whatever, because that's what it's going to take to get to the shot. And if we don't get the shot, then, we don't have the movie and you should be fired. And it's just all of these sorts of things are pretty common in this space. And it's not just film, right? It's, I mean, it's in, endemic to television as far as I can tell. 
Um, it's true of the music industry. When I worked in commercial music, it was true for the advertising industry. You know, I would be working till two, three o'clock in the morning sometimes uh, as an assistant music supervisor for, for a music production house in New York. And, and I just started to have this feeling constantly where I was like, why? What, like, I'm doing a, a, an ad for Kit Kat, you know, like we're doing a, like, this is so that McDonald's can sell another hamburger. And I'm like, I'm all for McDonald's selling another hamburger, but I don't need to kill myself for McDonald's to sell another hamburger. Like, that, that's not, I, I'm not pulling bullets out of people in an ER. I'm not saving lives. Like, like I'm not, I'm just making the world hopefully slightly more enjoyable right? Like that's kind of what my goal in life was at the time was like, I just want to do something that improves people's lives on the margins, you know? I mean, another McDonald's hamburger or a chocolate bar or a, a faster, more fun car, all that kind of stuff is great. And I, I have nothing against it, but like, I don't know why you would treat people horribly to get the you know, the, the, the entertainment content out of it. And the same thing is true of movies. I mean, again and again and again, when I, when I moved to Los Angeles, you know, I would have friends who were, you know, like on small projects, like it doesn't even matter what the scale is because, because tons and tons of small projects, student projects have the same vibe. You know, I'm, I'm the genius director and everybody else just needs to, you know, fall in line for my dictatorial vision. And so I guess I'm, what I'm saying is I'm starting from a place of a lot of sympathy for guys who, who spend 16, 18 hours on sets, you know, killing themselves as grips and gaffers and, you know, craft service people and like all of this kind of stuff happens all the time while they're not even making very much money, you know, in a town where money doesn't go as far as, as in the rest of the country yeah. as well. Oh, especially in LA, right? I mean, or in California in general, but I mean, certainly in LA, I mean, it's, it's one thing to make, you know, 16 or uh, $20 an hour or something in, uh, you know, even in Atlanta where I live, you know, you can, especially if you live out by where Pinewood is, I don't know if anybody knows, Pinewood's pretty far outside of town. So it's, it's like kind of rural Georgia at that point, you could, you could find a really cheap apartment that is very nice out in that area. And you would have a pretty good living on $20 an hour or $25 an hour, you know, even if you were just working as, as a grip or something like that. Um, you know, but in LA, that's nothing, nothing oh, no. at all. Yeah. And I and I moved out of Los Angeles. I I grew up just outside of L.A. Um, and I mean, there were celebrities living in the town. I I, I might have said this before, but I I literally used to uh, sell comic books to Leonardo DiCaprio um, <laughs> awesome. when I was a teenager. And uh, you know, it, it. But and I love California and I love that town. But it's I've just been priced out. Yeah. And yeah. even with my wife and family crammed into a little apartment uh, with us both working jobs, couldn't do it. And, and that was outside mm -hmm. of Los Angeles, um, you know, when you're right there in the middle of it. And I, there are people who are very successful um, television show writers and do this stuff and, and they're making good money but they're crammed into little apartments because that's all they can afford. I don't blame anybody for, I mean, any of the people over the last few years who've moved to, you know, Austin or Atlanta or, you know, even to just to out, you know, to Vegas or to Idaho or wherever, like people just, I have tons and tons of friends who, especially over the course of the pandemic, who just left LA, you know, I had a really good uh, buddy of mine who's a composer who's who's fairly successful who just moved to Atlanta, you know, um, and I and a big part of that was because he he and his wife they have a small child and like they want to actually have a life and and be able to own a home and and all you know all these kinds of things that is not a tiny little you know fifteen hundred square foot thing crammed in between 
you know, somebody else's uh, meth lab or whatever, which I feel like it's, <laughs> it's sort of like. <laughs> which is another reason. I mean, I um, I had, again, not naming names, but a, a very um, successful special effects artist uh, moved out of Los Angeles because he had a house. He could afford to live there, but his neighborhood was uh, but literally that. There was a... Yep. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think it was actually a meth lab, like had some sort of little explosion or something. Oh, and and the crime was going up in his suburban neighborhood uh, mm-hmm. that had never had these issues before. And uh, and that's kind of the greater bubble economically. Um, but, uh, well, crime, yeah, crime and economics kind of go hand in as well. But um, yeah. not saying economics is criminal, but when economics is bad, you have more crime. Um, sure. Yeah. But, but, um, and California is certainly suffering from that, but the IOTC, uh, union is not just in California. And right. I want to kind of go over some, a little bit of what is, uh, I, like I said, I have some notes here to help me out. Um, so, I mean, the IOTC demands, as far as I can tell, um they're asking for let's see um they are asking for better working hours which is totally understandable like you said i was just watching um the movies that made us uh and i know a lot of people that worked on aliens and it was about james cameron and he's notorious for being a taskmaster and there was a lot in that episode about how the british crew were just like this is a job you know this is insane and and how aliens was a very difficult job it wears on you and all we were doing is working we would work and we'd go home late and get up go work and come back and and it was just a a work fest for almost a year so it was pretty tough and jim is is demanding obviously and uh he just won't you know, he's like a bulldog. He gets hold of something. He won't let go until it's the way he wants it. He won't take no for an answer. So, which we knew. <laughs> we knew going in. You know, yeah. they, and James Cameron came out of the Roger Corman school where it was like six, seven days a week, long hours. Yeah. Uh, now, they we have better. literally no money. So we will yeah. do everything we can just manually and through. And as an independent basically. filmmaker, yeah. I understand that as well. Sure. Um, sure. And uh, let's see, they want better conditions, which, you know, working conditions, which I understand. They want lunch breaks. Absolutely. Oh, no. Lunch breaks. <laughs> they want to be able to go home and see their family. Now, this is interesting because um, yeah. we were going to, it's just the two of us, uh, you know this, but uh, I originally was also going to have Chris Gore from Film Thread on here because yeah. he had said some very interesting things as a podcast uh, live stream guest on Midnight's at Edge, which is another YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was, one of the interesting things that he was saying was that there's uh, a, a, like the set the director that everybody wants to get on their set for is clint eastwood because clint eastwood's like i want to get this shot and be done for the day in time for dinner yeah <laughs> notoriously one take right like he yeah. is, is notoriously a guy who just goes we got it um and you know barring really rare circumstances print let's move on you know yeah. i mean like unless the camera broke or they didn't get sound or something like that, maybe you'll get another take. But it's like, it's funny because I've always heard for years, actors, like on the one hand, actors freak out about it and then sort of complain about it a little bit. But then once they work with him, they're always like, oh, wow, no, that really forced me to like put my A game into that first, that first take. And then, you know, but that's all you get. But it, it also means you get to move on. You know, you get to do a shoot and it's it's not... You know, that's that's like almost the the anti, um, you know, sort of like you were talking about Cameron kind of thing or or um, Kubrick or Fincher Kubrick. I mean, it's Stanley Kubrick's like a perfect, like sort of opposite of that, where it's like we're going to do it 187 times until I get exactly the thing that I want. But that's so brutal on everyone. I mean, it's brutal on people's morale. It's and it's not just the actors, right? Like the actors have to go through it, but you know, you got your special effects guys have to like set up another door, or they have to set up another squib, or they got to do whatever. You've got your 
you or know, even you, post productions. I, I mean, if somebody if oh, I was miserable. editing a movie and somebody handed me 150 takes of the same, like I would no, I know. <laughs> and and I mean, so I uh, <laughs> I've given so so this is the other thing people probably don't know about me. I, I after after being a composer for and and music editor and music supervisor, I, I actually got more into editing, which is how I kind of worm my way into what I do now. Um, so I, I worked as an editor for a long time and I've edited hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of uh, videos and documentaries and things. And um, one of the things, a random piece of advice I always give people because it's one of these like too, too simple to be thought of by anybody things is like, just go to the end, go to your dead last take and work backwards instead of working forwards. <laughs> because if you stopped, it means you, you liked what you got, right? Like if you stop doing takes, but I cannot imagine going through, and then especially in an environment with like a Kubrick or somebody where I guarantee you Kubrick is has an assistant sitting next to him where he's saying, oh yeah, take 45 had something I liked. And then, you know, cut, cut to 25 takes later, you know, take 71 had something that I like, you know, and just, oh my gosh, I, I can't even begin, you know, but it's miserable, right? It's just a miserable experience working for people like that. Cause it's not, and, and the other thing too is, and this is, here's an economics thing for people is there's this idea, you know, from Carl Manger and uh, Eugene von, von Bauerk and, and guys like that, where it's like diminishing marginal returns are a thing, right? Like, oh, absolutely. You, you get some benefit to doing the next take, right? But that only goes so far. You can keep doing takes and takes and takes until you get to a point where there's negligible difference between you know, your 37th take and your 157th take. And it doesn't matter at that point. You're, you're just a tiny percentage point difference between each of these takes. And the question you know, I always ask is, um, would the audience know the difference? Yeah. You know? And, and it, yeah. And if the answer is no, and you don't have a really strong reason to do one over, over the other, because there are things that audiences aren't going to recognize that, you know, a good filmmaker will recognize. Right. But, and that are important, but man, yeah, if this... it's, if it's the difference between all oh, this actor, you know, she made a, a a smile that I would describe as wry instead of witty. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, sometimes, I mean, I could imagine being on a David Fincher set. He's going, he's having someone pull a beer out of the fridge like 50 times going by the, by the 50th take, it feels the most natural. And it's like, no, nobody watching a movie goes, I didn't quite believe how they picked up that beer. Right. Uh, you right. know, so I understand yeah. from that point of view, and I'm and, and working on budgets as well. It's you know, time is money, mm -hmm. um, and this is something that from the producer's perspective, <laughs> or, <laughs> or it's not money because you just don't pay people for. <laughs> yeah, that's and that's a big problem. Now, speaking of pay, one of the other things that the union members want is they want more yeah. profit share. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they want more, I guess, points. And again, I don't know the specifics of this, but in, uh, in video on demand, because it's a newer medium, they've been getting less. And right. with some video on demand platforms, they've been getting even less than that because the video on demand platforms are still kind of struggling. And this is it, the, the video on demand wars. I don't know what you would call them, but I don't think they're done by a long shot. I mean, now we've no. got Pe Peacock, we've got Hulu. Yeah. Disney Plus seems to be dropping off because even though they've got a nice Disney library, it's, you know, I mean, my my girls watch it, but I go back yeah. to it and I go like, well, I've, I've watched everything I'm interested on here. If, if it wasn't mm -hmm. for my girls, I would have canceled it. And yeah, I, think a I, lot I of have that problem I, I, with Disney Plus. I, I think were I not somebody who did a pop culture related I, I didn't produce pop culture related content for a living. I, I don't think I would still have Disney plus. There are a handful of things that, you know, Apple TV, even maybe I would, I would pick up for um, Ted Lasso or something like that. And then I would probably drop it, you know, uh, in between seasons of stuff, mythic quest. Um, 
Which Disney you Plus also is, did a video on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Disney uh Disney Plus especially is one that I just I don't go back to, you know. Well, I enjoyed the Mandalorian, but at the same time I asked myself, you know, sure. if, if with the price of everything going up at the moment, that doesn't just mean streaming services. I mean, that means everything, my grocery bill, my gas, my my mm -hmm. utilities and that sort of thing. Like I said, my girls enjoy it. Um, so yeah. we keep it, but uh if i if i said oh season three of the mandalorian is coming out or the book of boba fett do i need to see it eh, uh, you know if it comes yeah. around eventually you know yeah. it's like and I, I mean again it's one of these things where you could you could absolutely wait until the season is over pick up disney plus for a month whatever and then drop it again you know and you i think people do that yeah, which is something just economically the streaming services are having to contend with. And so I understand why they would want to negotiate to give less of a share of that, because one of the other things that, uh, you know, I, I've noticed and somebody pointed out is that these, you know, a successful show on a streaming service is footing the bill for all the other things that don't work or the mm -hmm. experiments, you know, the things, you know, it's like, uh, somebody yeah. pointed out that, you know, one person from one show complaining about Dave Chappelle's special needs to yeah. keep in mind that Dave Chappelle's success, you know, that grind that he's been on for 30 years yep. is making it possible for your show to exist at all. And if and I think if the um, the thing and uh, again, I don't. I don't know what the best fair share for a union to take of any show is, but it seems to me yeah. that it's, there's going to come a point where if everyone's got a little bit of that profit sharing, the person that is investing at some point may go, you know what, it's just not worth it to have this show at all. And then there's no yeah. job for them to work on. So this is something yeah. for the people in the unions that I am concerned about because it's a market force. And market force is something that I've heard come up. Uh, the first time I heard the term was when um, I was helping with a Kickstarter for a movie called Harbinger Down, um, created uh, and directed by Alec Gillis, who's a co-founder of Studio ADI, who I used to work for. And I was like, market force, what's that? And he was talking in terms of old movies that are like Blade Runner and The Thing and, and movies he worked on. He said, we used to get to like, R&D, our special effects for about a year, but he, his quote was, there's a market force that keeps shrinking that pre-production time. It's mm -hmm. like, now it's like three months because yeah. when an investor borrows money, and this is the thing that people don't understand is that is borrowed money. It starts accruing interest uh, as soon as they take it out, as soon as they right. fund right. the movie. The reason that, that pre-production schedules are getting so short now is that uh, studios, it's the money that studios use, uh, they're borrowing from line of, lines of credit and they pay interest on, the, on that money. And now the money is, the, the dollar amounts are so great. You're making a $200 million movie yeah. and you start borrowing that money, you start paying interest on that immediately. Right. So they want to stall off paying the interest. They want to minimize those costs. So there are, right now, there, it's, it's sort of a Hollywood-wide um, studio... Uh, mandate uh the, in in most of the big studios that it's a three-month pre-production time schedule really used to be nine months used to be wow. six months now three they're just saying months. that's all we can afford folks because of interest it's because they're spending 200 million bucks on a movie right. because the hollywood model has become chasing the big tent pole right summer blockbuster Come and on. and to, and to be clear i mean this is this is you know ultimately even a small uh, you know, return on interest for the bank in, in that kind of thing. Um, you, you could be talking about interest payments of several million dollars a month, right? I mean, on a, on a $200 million movie or whatever, I mean, it's not a small thing, right? I mean, you're, you're talking about a lot of money racking up very, very, very quickly. And, and so I, I imagine that, um, and again, was, this is one of the things that Chris Gore said, you know, he kind of imagined, like in Dune, that scene where they're going, like, I want you to squeeze, you know? I want you to squeeze and squeeze and squeeze! Give me spice! Drive them. Drive them into utter submission. Do not show the slightest pity or mercy. Never stop. 
go. Go! Show no mercy! Get back! <laughs> <laughs> They are squeezing, but yeah. they're yeah. under the gun as well. There's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not just pure greed or, like I said, mustache twirling. It's just well, business. It's the, the, the greed thing is an interesting one to me because people talk about this all the time. And it's a little bit of a pet peeve of mine because, first of all, greed is, I think anybody should understand that greed is a constant, right? Like the, the movie studios are greedy the people working for the studios are greedy. You like, I mean, I, you can't, you can't say that a lot of what the union demands are right now is not built out of a desire for more, a desire Mm -hmm. for more uh, income, a desire for more time, a desire for all of those kinds of things. Everybody has, and I'm not saying everybody as an individual is quote equally greedy. Some people, you know, have, uh, are more content with less. Some people, you know, want more or whatever. But I mean, I think on net, like people in general tend to be greedy in that sense, right? The question really becomes what what institutions are in place that allow you to get ahead and, and achieve the things that you want, achieve your goals. How do you do that, right? Like what are the institutions around doing that? Like, are you able to do that through, um, theft right or violence or like like what are what are the kinds of tools that you have at your disposal and then if the tool is i have to make a really good product that somebody else wants to buy i'm not really worried about the greed piece of it very much and that i know you wanted to talk about this a little bit anyway but it gets to the question of like where unions versus you know especially large corporations and unions both where is the 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 force, the coercion involved in those arenas and where should we be looking? Because like a union has a lot of benefit or let me rephrase, collective bargaining in general can have a lot of benefit just as a concept because what it can do is say like, we offer X amount of value for the studio and the studio has to decide whether or not meeting the union demands is worth capturing that value that the union is offering. They're saying we've got better trained people. We've got more consistent crews. We've got, um, you know, we, we make sure that everybody is, uh, you know, s- sort of uh, at, a, at a minimum standard of capability and competence and all that kind of stuff uh, th- that they have to be in order to join the union, right? So you're not just hiring random people and especially on, on a set, you know, a production where you need hundreds and hundreds of, of you know, of people from different unions, you want some way of vetting your your hires, right? Okay, so that's a pretty good sales pitch, I feel like. The union sales pitch to competent people is, if you join our union, competent person, we'll make sure that you get paid well and that you get breaks and that you're, you know, not killing yourself every day and that you have a better working experience. And they do that by negotiating with companies. That to me seems great, right? Like there's nothing wrong with doing that and it, potentially some benefit to doing that. But if you add uh, legal aspects to this that change the weighting of the institution, let's say you, you allow the union power to say everybody who is in this industry must join a union or you compel the business to work with the, the union, then what the unions can do is ultimately make bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger demands up to the, because they, they have a captive audience. They've, they've got members that are required to be there and they've got studios that are required to work for them. So they can start making demands up to a point or past a point where it would be profitable for the studio to even bother working with the union at all, at which point they just go to somewhere else. They go to, you know, uh, Prague or whatever and do a non-union shoot in Europe somewhere, right? And this actually came up because there were they were shooting in Prague, like uh, Aliens versus Predator. This is, I mean, the movie's over ten years old now, but sure, they started shooting in Prague, and then the Prague citizens started catching on to how much money it was bringing in. But then they unionized yeah. and became too difficult for the studios to deal with, and the studios so- pulled production from there, and then nobody's working again. So yeah. 
So you can really, you can, you can overplay your hand as a union to a point where you've, you've eliminated jobs for everybody, right? Where it wasn't like if you were, and again, this kind of gets that question of like greed, and right? it's like, it's like, this is also, and nobody thinks of unions as being potentially greedy or individual workers as being potentially greedy, but it works on both sides, right? But likewise, you don't want to give power, especially legal power to the studios to say, we're the only game in town and there can't be any competition to our, you know, to our productions or whatever. And by the way, we do this as well, especially in terms of film incentives, right? Like there are a lot of film incentives and not just film incentives. Let's, let's take China, for example. I mean, there's, there's only something like a dozen, I think 12, maybe 13 movies per year that are allowed into China from other countries, right? To, to be screened in Chinese theaters, a very small number of, of movies. So guess who gets access to China, right? It's the majors. It's not anybody else. You're not going to get your little indie movie screened in China, even if you could pass their censors and all that kind of stuff. Like they, they're going to have some variant of pay to play, right? And the studi studios are going to be able to handle that. Little guys aren't going to be able to handle that. Similarly, you know, studios are really good at finding tax incentives and they are really good at finding subsidies you know, and, and actually just advocating for them, going to a, you know, a city, you know, like New Orleans or something and saying, hey, we'll, we'd love to shoot this movie in your city, but if you, you know, we'll do it if you kick in $15 million, but we won't do it if you don't, right? We'll, we'll go to uh, Raleigh or somewhere else, right? So, you know, you got to be careful on both sides of this, because if you have studios with all that power, then they can start rejecting uh, deals or they can, you know, um, they have, they now have a lot more power, uh, because they have less competition and it's, it's the same, it's, it's this balancing act of trying to find, you know, the, the middle point of like naturally not giving either of them undue power and then saying the only thing that you can work out or should work out are the things that you work out voluntarily. Um, and then also the same is true for all of the, employees, right? So you want people who are free to take a non-union job, or at least I do, right? Like I would want people to be free to take a non-union job if that job was going to benefit them more than the union job. Um, and I think, again, the union has to sell their benefits to the members, or theoretically it should have to sell their benefits to the members. And if, like we were talking about, uh, like we were talking at the beginning, if they don't come back from a negotiation like this with a much better deal than people had before, what's the benefit, right? What's the benefit of joining a union if they're only going to get you the same thing that you already had without them or with your previous arrangement, you know what I mean? So Yeah, and this, this seems to be the case with uh, the current deal. A lot of union members are coming back saying that they're not really happy that the hours still seem to be about the same and, yeah. and that they're not going to sign off on it. Um, yeah. An interesting thing that also comes to mind um, is uh, like with, with me, it's, I, I got out of California because I wanted to make really low budget movies. And even with like SAG low budget using SAG in this, as an example, it's like, I just can't do it. You know, my budget, my budgets mm -hmm. are so low and you know part of that is yeah just comes down to you know the the equipment the programs i mean uh i, I do want to get into a little bit of what the the model for independent filmmaking is becoming and yeah. what it can become in the future if people kind of let go of some of the ideas but in terms of sag actors there's a lot i'd love to work with some of them do what's called ficor which is they can yeah. Uh, work outside of, of SAG if they want to. And I believe the California Supreme Court ruled as well that you can't be compelled to join a union. But yeah. one thing that I notice is that I have union friends and every once in a while they'll post something like, don't work on this project. Like they'll like tell yeah. everybody, you are yeah. not to work on this non-union project. It's kind of, you know, it's like this weird well, it's intimidation. Like scabs, right? Like it's, scabs. It's a yeah, it's like they're they're scabs for working on a non non union show. They're undercutting, they're underbidding what the union is supposed to be. You know, even though it's a you know should be a personal 
decision for that individual, you know, but it's, well, and not, this is, they're not being team players at that point. So, yeah, but this comes down to interfering with the free market. You know, it, it may be yeah. that they're undercutting, but it may be if they're not paying union dues on that, they're still making a little more money, which yeah. in that case, the union kind of makes it more difficult for people to individually negotiate and be competitive on their own, which is uh, something that I think is very important. I mean, I, I negotiate with my independent film stuff, uh, you know, I talk to actors and work out, you know, like, hey, we'll give you points on this, or maybe you can offer an actor being a producer on something, mm -hmm. to get, you know, or yeah. people who want to just come in. And this is another thing. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are on the table. I, I won't even get into the fact that this is yet another union who is resisting mandatory jabs. Um, and that, but another thing that, um, Oh, gee, I lost my train of thought. What was that I was going to say? Um, the uh, oh yes, they want a living wage for even their lowest paid workers, yeah. which is I mean that always sounds nice. Everybody wants a living wage, but yeah. at the same time, I did a lot of free jobs. I did a lot of jobs that yeah. were um, you know below because they just couldn't afford to have me otherwise, but mm -hmm. I gained the experience and I gained the credibility that later led to me working yeah. uh, well, jobs that did have a, a living wage. So I, I, I think it's a, uh, people and unfortunately, especially Hollywood people really have a poor understanding of a lot of this stuff. I mean, no matter what you mandate or legislate or, you know, bake into a contract, even, I mean, the, the real minimum wage is, I mean, it's just, Sort of a truism the only the real minimum wage will always be zero right that it doesn't matter what you what price floor you set right what will actually happen at some point is that the wage is that that you have mandated or or contractually required even is higher than this person will is worth right and it's not it is another thing too and i've, I've talked about this in other contexts but people really do a bad job of like equating moral worth, like worth as a human being with economic value, right? And the reality is like your, your career, your pay is predicated largely. And fortunately, I think this is, this is still true of the vast majority of the United States and most of the freer parts of the world. Obviously it's not going to be true in the least free parts of the world, but where you have primarily free economies or mostly free economies, you will still find that people's income is pretty directly tied to the amount of value that they create as an individual for whatever entity that they're working for, even if they're just working for themselves. I mean, it's you're working for clients and you're, the, what you can command is, is entirely based on what that client believes you're, you're going to be what, what value they believe you're going to be creating for them. But right? Sean, is it fair that a football player or an actor gets millions of dollars while the grip gets minimum wage? Fair, right? Like, like nothing in life is, is fair in the sense that you might think it's, it's perfectly equitable. But the reality is, you know, a, um, a LeBron James can command tremendously larger salaries than anybody working concessions because he's what people are coming to see he you know? sells and the tickets he's, he's he's selling yeah and tickets and merch and and you know uh pay-per-view and everything right like everything you can imagine espn subscriptions um and so you know unfortunately the guy working the concession stand is not doing that he's creating some value obviously creating enough to to be worth uh, hiring somebody to run a concession stand, but that's not the same thing. And I think where people get really tripped up about this stuff is that they've, they, when they start mandating wage floors, they start to lose those bottom rungs of the ladder for people who want to break in. You know, I mean, one of the ways that I did, and I'm in some composers groups with some, with some relatively famous composers, not relatively like very, very famous composers. Sorry, I was like, I was like relatively, and then I was like, well, one of the main posters is probably the most famous composer of all, well, currently. So that's kind of silly, but um, but uh, they all, every one of them, uh, sort of like guys like me who have no, you know, don't even really compose anymore, but who did okay for a little while, you know, doing small projects, 
and then like the biggest name people in, in the industry, um, every one of them will tell you that they did free work at one point or another, you know, and it's not, uh, it's not like an argument in favor of working for free. It's just to say that like, if you need experience and if you want to break in to any industry, you need to learn the ropes, you know, and you need to learn how to do certain things that you may not know how to do. And one tool in your tool belt is price, right? Like that's the one thing that you can sort of control over uh, more experienced people in order to get a job that you might not, not have had access to before. Because if, right. With, if uh, you're priced really high, then I would just go, you've got zero experience. Uh, but this guy who's priced about the same uh, has a lot of experience. So I'm going to go with that guy, you know, and you'll just price yourself out of all of those low level opportunities. Well, with, um, with two, yeah. two points to that one personally with, uh, I got in with Studio ADI, which is, was my dream job, by when they did their Harbinger Down Kickstarter, they were trying to crowdfund, and I said, and I was really broke at the time, and I was like, I saw an opportunity, and I was like, look, I don't have any money to give you, but I can give you my time, and I do know how to bring in more eyeballs, and that was, that was how I got um, to be their director yeah. of social media was because they yeah. thought I did a great job with that. And, um, uh -huh. but I did it for free, but it was totally worth it. The other thing that I, I want my, my first, sorry, my first job in, in uh, video production, um, I walked into a, like a wedding videography studio off the street. And I was like, are there any jobs? Nope, no jobs. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, how about I come in on Monday? I'll work for a day for free. And then if you, if you like what I did, if I'm useful to you, then pay me $6 an hour. And, you know, I just want to learn stuff. And that was the sales pitch and it worked. And I worked there for like eight months. And like, then I got some skills working for very little money and then immediately turned around and got a much better job, probably paid about twice as much, you know, right, right afterwards. Well, I love that because that's negotiating and, and mm -hmm. people these days, uh, I mean, every, pretty much every day, every interaction we have is some form of negotiation and people don't want to see it that way. They, they want to just be like, well, I'm entitled to this for my work or that. And it's like, well, it, maybe that's so, maybe not, you know, maybe. it's, it's, right. it's like you said, it's about adding value. So if you can start with, here's the value I add and they gain that value, then they go, they get a taste of it and they go, oh, this person is adding value. What is that yeah. worth to me to keep them around, to keep them going? Some employers are not very smart about that. They get mm -hmm. people who add value and they take them for granted and then they and lose them. I think we're seeing that right now across the board, right? I, th I think there's oh, a yeah. lot of people quitting jobs that they might otherwise be good at, probably in part because they don't feel valued enough. And at the moment, I mean, this is part of it, but a lot of people are, you know, they're getting plenty of money to stay at home, uh, mm -hmm. which is not incentivizing them. And incentive is something else that I want to talk about briefly, because just going back to, you know, the big celebrity, one of the things I've heard is, hey, if this big celebrity is making $40 million to be in this movie, why can't we just ask them to take 35 and then, uh, you know, give 5 million of that to the set mm -hmm. workers, which, I mean, that sounds nice, but what I think people don't realize is that, again, negotiating value and, and will that celebrity bring uh, value and profits to that mm -hmm. film, which again, yeah. if they get profit sharing would roll over to them. But, you know, say you do offer them 35, but somebody else comes along and says, no, we got the 40. Yeah. You know, yeah. of anybody, you know, unless it's a passion project, unless it's something like, mm -hmm. no, I, I just have to do this film. Of course, they're going to take the 40. And yeah. then and then again, you lose out. So again, this is these are the market forces that I wish people just and, took a little they, more and they time have to understand. People. Yeah, I mean, and you get to a point, you know, especially if you're a celebrity, you get to a point where you've got people whose job it is to negotiate on your behalf right? Like people, agents and managers and stuff, whose entire role is to say, let me see where we can find more opportunities and better opportunities. And, and, and that's not you know, just greed because it is actually expensive to be a celebrity. 
It, that's the other well, that's, thing people think that's about. That's true too. <laughs> that is true too. But look, at the same time, I mean, again, you're talking about people who command that because they're they're bringing at least they're perceived to to have that level of value. And generally speaking, you still see this. I mean, this is fairly, you know, merit, you know, fairly generally a meritocracy still. I mean, again, there's there's nepotism. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff you could you could complain about there. Here and there, but the reality is, like, if y- you can still see the fact that if a celebrity starts to not bring in the kind of revenue that they're expected to bring in, and that they that studios anticipate, they they'll lose their career just as fast as anyone else. I mean, so it's not it's not like people are just you know entitled to that forty million dollar paycheck. You know, I mean, they are they're being uh, presented with that opportunity because the studios believe in their ability to draw, uh, you know, draw audiences. If that stops happening, that, you know, that can go away in a heartbeat. And we've seen it happen innumerable times, right? Like there, how many celebrities, you know, went from being the, the next big thing to being somebody you barely even see anymore or somebody yeah. who does, uh, you know, or a listers and you're like yeah. what what are they doing in this movie and then you're like mm-hmm. oh they're they're in their 70s now and they're not they're not as hot as when i was yep. uh you know in the 80s or 90s yeah. even even actors i know who aren't big names they're still names yeah. that if you you get it on your movie people go oh yeah they're they work pretty regularly um my <laughs> it's funny my um well, again i won't name any names one actor friend of mine i uh, was talking about having him in, in one of my next movies. And he's like, I'm a name right now, but I might not be next week. <laughs> he's like, yeah, but it's true. And I, I think, I, I think, um, I don't remember who I was having this conversation with a while back, but like, there's a big difference in the being a part of an industry that's a hits based type of industry versus uh, an industry that is a, really built around consistent production, right? So like with music or, you know, any kind of entertainment, sports, uh, movies, TV, whatever, like it's really like you're the, the big earners, right, are the ones that do some really big hits and they're, they're hitting the home runs. But we also recognize that, A, that there's an element of chance to that and there's an element of that that is not something people can, can maintain for a long period of time. So like athletes, really great example. There's a pretty tight window of where you can be a top level pro athlete and then past that window, past, you know, generally your physical window as your physicality starts to decline, you know, those big opportunities, those multi-million dollar paychecks, they're gone, right? So you're, you're capitalizing on a, a moment in time where you are going to be the most valuable person, one of the most valuable people in the world for a very short amount of time. Alternatively, there are people who go get engineering degrees and go work for a manufacturing company as a, you know, paid, well-paid engineer that goes from a $80,000 a year salary to a, you know, even a $200,000 a year salary over the course of a, you know, a 10-year period. And then they just, they continue to just get a pretty decent income for the rest of their lives. And they can, you know, parlay that into, um, you know, uh, investments and anything else and, and stuff like that. And it's very consistent. You know that like, this is a career that you can do for 30, 40 years, whether or not you're at the same company is immaterial, right? Like you're, you're going to be able to consistently do your, the thing that you're trained to do. Celebrities, sometimes you only have a year maybe two years, right, of where you're actually being really hot, and then suddenly it's gone. And so I I don't, I think where we get to the a problem is where we start to say, like, this is what this needs to be, and we're going to legally mandate one over over another. And you're really missing, like, this just enormous range of different ways of capitalizing on skills, you know, and I mean, and I mean, for the individual, not for the studios or anybody else, I mean, for you, right? Like, you have this opportunity to really sell yourself and do a, as good of a job as you can, you know, capitalize on your abilities, your interests, the things that make you valuable to somebody else. And if you want to do that in an industry, like you, you're a boxer and you want to do that, 
you know, I honestly, I say more power to you if you can negotiate into a multi-million dollar paycheck for a single fight, because that may be the only one that you really get, you know, uh, as a boxer, then you end up having to do something else for the rest of your life. And it's, it's, I think it'd be a shame if we started mandating what versions of, you know, pay structures and, and all that kind of stuff that people can do, because it really takes away your opportunities and especially the kind of interesting ones, you know, um, anybody can go to work for a company at $50,000 a year and just grind away for forever doing something, you know, accounting or whatever. Well, even in the movie industry, you know, you Mm -hmm. have your passionate people um, and then you've got your people on set that are going like, when's time and a half start, you know, that's, that's, Uh, and they're and they're literally and i don't think there's anything wrong with that either by the way yeah like, it's fine well they're again i'm not fine, but, i'm not uh, saying this is this is typical but i have encountered people who are literally trying to run out the clock just so they can start getting time and a half like you're going like sure. why why aren't you done yet and you realize oh it's actually because they know if they yeah. if they don't finish in time which again can add more expense to a production. I mean, there's just so many factors, you know. Um, I would say there's something wrong with that because that's yeah. that is somebody not doing their job. But what, well, I, yeah. what I mean is like is like whether or not you want to work a, a type of job that you know gets you home at five, or you want to work a job that takes up all of your time. I I don't want to be the one to try to tell you what's okay for you to do. Now, what I I think is interesting about everything that's going on in Hollywood is that we're seeing a big movement of people who are saying, I don't want to be here till two o'clock in the morning. And I, but yet I I still believe that I am creating a lot of value for you. How about we renegotiate this and get this down to a point where we can balance these things better? And I, in a lot of ways, I'm for it because I think that it's, it's sort of overdue. But I also know what Hollywood unions have done again and again and again, which is, again, overplay their hand. Well, that and also they they could totally screw themselves as a result. Yeah. And also what you negotiate for one person may not be good Mm -hmm. for all of your union members. You know, it it may be that there are people who would rather uh, work long. You know, they may be a single young person that just loves Mm -hmm. being there and really believes yeah. in the project, but they're in the, you know, they're on a roll and they may get, oh, no, you got to clock out for the day, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, man, that's a dangerous thing too. I, one of my best friends is a truck driver and that, those kinds of rules are, in, are uh, like constant in the trucking industry. So they're very, very specific about how many hours somebody can drive. And as a result, uh, one of the things that they've done to, um, to enforce those mandates is put um, to basically put GPS systems and like time trackers in the trucks. So they're, they're monitored, right? The problem is the state will fine you for going over your time. But what this ends up meaning is that sometimes truck drivers, and you, you'll probably have seen this if you drive on the freeways at all, sometimes truck drivers literally have to pull over on the side of the road, wherever they happen to be, and uh, whatever, take a nap in their truck, watch TV in their truck, whatever it is for six hours or, or however long the, the period is before they can literally move again. And so that actually becomes a problem because they know that they're going, the, the incentives are now really skewed because instead of going, look, I've worked eight hours today and I'm not, sp- or 10 hours or whatever it is, and I'm not supposed to go past 10 hours, but there's a truck stop 20 minutes from here that I can get to and pull in and stop for the night, right? Or there's a hotel over here and I can stop over here. They go, well, my meter is about to find me, right? I'm now about to lose $200 uh, just to go the, the next mile or the next minute or whatever. That's a terrible incentive, right? I mean, so you've got to be really careful about what incentives you create. And if it's if it's incentives that, that um, you know, encourage people to work less until they can get time and a half. That's a bad incentive. But it's also a terrible incentive to tell somebody who's 25 years old, it's working in an art department that they need to stop uh, at, you know, 6 p.m. or whatever, even though one more hour, and they know that one more hour would get them to the sculpt that they want or the, the, you know, visual design that they were looking for. 
you know, I, it's, yeah, it's just, I, I think when we get to too much mandates and, and ignore individuals in that process on either side of it, it gets really bad. I'll tell you, for me, I, I spent after I had, um, I had in 2010, I had a really bad breakup and I moved to start a new job in a different city. Um, and all I wanted to do was work. And so I, I did, I worked as a video editor and a producer and I was working 12 to 14 hours a day, every single day. And I did that for a year and I loved it. Um, it was challenging and tiring, but I learned a ton. I learned tons of stuff that I still use today in terms of the way to organize and manage time in, in projects that had a ton of projects that were happening simultaneously. Um, if somebody had told me that you're not allowed to do that, like I would have actually had a much worse time because I would have wallowed in, in kind of negative feelings and uh, there's, there's so many just a whole bunch of stuff. There's so many factors way. too. I mean, you know, sometimes you get people like, I want to do this job, but <clears throat> this person's willing to work harder than me and they want it more. Yeah. Therefore we should put rules on them to, to stop them from, you know, it, yeah. It, yeah. there's all sorts of, like I said, incentives. Uh, it, I hate to say it, but there's incentives for people who don't work as hard to want more regulations just you know, because they don't want to look bad in the face of somebody who yeah. does better work or that's, that's most corporate regulations, right? Like this guy's out competing me. So uh, my, you know, my competition is, is becoming a problem. So let's regulate them out of existence. Like that's, which is what's happening to a lot of small businesses. And, mm -hmm. uh, and actually let's, let's talk about that because I don't, uh, we're getting low on time, but I, I, I want to address independent filmmakers yeah um who you know i'll use myself as an example because i'm i'm the person that's kind of in the thick of this but i think this applies to yeah. a lot of people is like i said i can't afford to work with unions and these days like i'm i'm using my black magic pocket cinema camera as a webcam right now i love this camera there's um you know websites that are they're resource. i'm using an a7 by the way just a set for for what it's worth. I've got a Sony A7 up here. Not Which is also a great camera, great, great low light camera. Um, I did consider that one. Um, but there's, you know, you can go online, you can get sound libraries, visual effects libraries, stock footage. Um, mm -hmm. There are places you can get this place for free. I go to freesound.org a lot. Yep. People will yeah. upload uh, audio clips and that sort of thing. I up also upload audio clips onto there because I, I want to give something back to it. You're, you're a good person. They just harass <laughs> me about uploading uh, stuff. stuff that, I, I have done a little bit, but not very much, but I've, I've been a, I've been a, cause it used to be a members only. Well, mm -hmm. it sort of still is. You got to log in or whatever, but um, yeah, I've been a member of freesound.org site for, I don't know, 12 years or more. I mean, it's been around for quite a while. And well, what I'm finding is yeah. People's ability to make movies, whether it's internet resources or just affordable equipment. I mean, I've, I've got an LED light right here that I got mm -hmm. off of Amazon, mm -hmm. um, you know, and uh, the whole Jeff Bezos, William Shatner thing. That's like a whole other subject, um, you know, but it's I mean, right. Amazon has greatly improved my quality of life. Yeah. Uh, and and just I mean, I've got lav mics it's all this stuff that years ago oh if, yeah if you would have told insane. me i would have been able to afford to have yeah. an inventory of, of filmmaking equipment even in the the uh, amount of money that i make right now um i wouldn't have believed it and now oh, it's I, like I, it's 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 wild man like we that closet behind me is is filled with camera gear and 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 stuff like that i mean i have a, I have a room full of instruments here but like i have a lot of production equipment in a you know fairly large closet behind me, and I've got um, stuff that you know. I remember when I was a kid, I was I was playing in in rock and roll bands and and jazz combos and stuff like that. And you know, my brother uh, had to like we we spent every penny we had on PA, right? Like like every bit of money that we had, and and we put together a sort of a PA system that was you know honestly not even very good. The same kind of 
thing that we would we did then that was really kind of jerry rigged and and kind of this cobbled like he literally he got amps from a um a grocery store that had been that got, went out of business they had a bunch of in-store like rack mounted amps that they were using for their store pa system and and like it was just terrible right and we did that because we didn't have any money and we, we were just trying to like put together whatever system we could put together but you could go to Amazon or anything, you know, Sweetwater or whatever, and you could buy a pretty nice, you know, all encompassing PA system for a few hundred dollars at this point. Like it would be absurd, like the amount of like high, and it's way higher quality than anything that we had when I was a kid. Oh yeah. You know, same thing, I, microphones for days, I've got, you know, but you, you name it, right? And it's- It's an embarrassment of riches. And yet I yeah. see people, complaining like oh no we need a better camera oh no you know it's like yeah. oh, we, we need oh we need this we need that and it's like yeah i understand why they think that way but yeah. this at the same time and this is something a discussion that i'm having with someone at the moment they there's a um you know this kind of like oh the black magic is you know it's a good camera but the airy is you know just got that you know, and I'm going like the yeah. black magic is a beautiful camera. You can do so much with yep. it. Don't, you know, the audience oh, again is never going to know the difference. And the post-production tools now are, are radically different. I mean, like you can have, and we do, I mean, we use LUTs for everything now. So you, especially with black magic camera, I mean, you've got a, a very flat image going in, but a lot of data that you can play with. And so you, you've got, tons of opportunities to tweak that the way that you want you can make it warmer cooler you can you know toy with um you know dynamic range there's all kinds of things you can do and it's all you know you know if you use adobe or whatever it's 50 bucks a month i mean it's just so much of the, and for the entirety of their their whole network of of pieces of software that i just their, learned their entire how to ecosystem I just learned all about how to go into sound waves of my crappy audio and yeah. just paint out and delete all the little, you know, and like, oh, is it mm -hmm. too reverby? Here's D-verb. You know, it's like, yeah, D-verb, man, D-verb is, is, is this crazy thing to me that like you used to only be able to get with like expen more expensive pieces of software, third party software like Isotope, or you'd have to have hardware based um you know de-reverb tools right like you'd have to literally run this through a processing tool that was a, a chunk of hardware that you had on a rack and like you don't even have to do that like adobe, i mean actually i think you know the a lot of the third party apps are still better than adobe's but adobe's is fine if you yeah. use it for you know the vast majority of just sort of you know dialogue in like reasonably normal spaces right like totally fine um, and obviously you're not going to get, uh, you're, you're not going to de-reverb a metal tank or anything, but whatever, it's fine. You know? Well, this is the thing. And, and again, it's, it's a person can make a feature film now from home. A matter of fact, mm -hmm. I have done that. It's taken me a long time because there were a lot of lessons learned and there were a lot of delays because especially when you're, here's you the trade off effects stuff too. You know, like, you're yeah. Yeah. Like, well, it, the, the thing is, is, yeah, I did a lot of effects because I'm an effects guy and I had a lot of fun doing that. And, and uh, you know, but I mean, the trade off of working with volunteers is they're not as experienced or they yeah. may have or the time. Slow. when yeah. yeah. And they may have the time when they they say they'll do it, but then stuff happens. And I mm -hmm. understand that it's not something that I get mad about. I learned yep. a lot uh, from the experience of making this movie and it's finally almost done. Um, but one of the things that I really think is going to happen in the near future and already is happening, and you can tell me if this sounds absurd, but I believe this pretty strongly these days based on what I've observed, especially with comic books, people crowdfunding their comic books, mm -hmm. is um, you're going to see more of people not so much financing their films through crowdfunding, but after they've finished a low budget film financing their PNA, their, you know, collectibles. There are that's I, yeah. I I think that the thing is is that while Hollywood is focusing on the broadest possible mm -hmm. audience and trying to 
uh, uh, cater to Hol or China, you know, that sort of thing, or broad audiences, they are also losing some people who are going, you know, who were their original core audience. Uh, yeah. You know, it used to be that audiences were more specific. And I think independent filmmakers now have an opportunity. Instead yeah. of chasing after that Hollywood money or going, I'm going to make this movie and then Hollywood's going to discover me or that sort of mm -hmm. thing, focus on making a library of movies mm -hmm. in the same way that you would have a stock portfolio. They may not be super successful to start but as yeah. you continue to make movies and if you can find an audience you know this even the 1000 true fans apply here if you can make the um mm -hmm. the movies cheap enough which i believe can be done there are local actors you know they're not celebrities but you know things like horror movies have built-in fan base no, without celebrities sure. you sure. know so i think that if people were if independent filmmakers focus more on getting their budgets way down, uh, working within their means rather than writing scripts going, oh, I wish I had, I got to get the money to do this. It's like, no, that's that's where you're losing money. Yeah. Build up that library, build up that following and, and find niche markets that you can sell to and grow at grassroots over time. Because I think if your fifth movie ends up having a huge following and is a big hit because you do it that way, they're going to, yep then your past movies, your library, as long as you retain your IP, which is another mistake that I find a lot of people uh, yep. do. That's uh, a tricky one. Yeah, you know, is uh, it will become more valuable. So my plan is I'm willing to get video on demand distribution and, you know, negotiate that, but I'm hoping to retain, and I know, I know this is not as big a market as it used to be, but the market is still there. Physical media like Blu-rays, people mm -hmm. like collectibles, that sort of thing. I think that is where independent filmmaking is heading. And I think if it turns out that between the unions and Hollywood, it, it something snaps and it isn't as sustainable, I think Hollywood's going to have mm -hmm. to start looking at making some concessions of what as well it's like the matrix too when he goes into to the architects thing you won't let it happen you can't you need human beings to survive there are levels of survival we are prepared to accept <laughs> yeah, like, yeah you know it's like well it, so i think i think you're i think there's a lot of there's a lot to that i i, I think that there's going to be a lot of challenges with some people, especially like trying to figure out what the balance is. But one of the things, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, but like when you have, and Hollywood's done this to a, to a really big degree where it's like, you now have tent poles that are $200 million plus productions. You still have a handful of like $75 million movies, but like, you just don't see this range. You don't see a lot of like, 15 million dollar 20 million like you don't see this like sort of ramping up into these big big tent pole things as a result like the risks are really high and hollywood has to make them for you know what they call the four quadrant audiences they have they have to you know young old men women like the whole thing they have to do this be, and then thus now they're also you know courting chinese money and and everything else to try to make back hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars so you're, I think you're you're on to something for sure with like a lower budget model where, you know, if you have to make back a million dollars, way, way, way easier to do than making back $200 million, right? Have to make, make back $500,000 even easier, right? Halloween so, Kills, I think, is an example of this, though. I mean, there are yeah. some, mainly well, it's see, horror. And I, and I would, it is mainly horror. And I would, I would point to Jason Blum and Blumhouse for a lot of that, because obviously he did um, you know, he's very smart in sort of restructuring a studio based around, you know, uh, kind of a mid-level version of what you're talking about, which is like, you know, uh, maybe actors or directors who've like lost a little bit of their, their juice, you know, or up and coming guys who, who aren't there yet, right? Who, who like he's tagged as being really good potential, but who haven't made a big hit you know, and then doing those movies for $3 million, right? And then going out and distributing them to, um, you know, to as many people as they, as they can. And, uh, you know, making back 30 or 100 even in some cases, right? So great, well, well done, right? 
Um, but I think you could take that same model for a lot of other things. I think the trick though is, you know, when you're talking about distribution, so many distributors are gonna want the rights, right? They're gonna want total control over everything. So maintaining that control is gonna be hard. But that said, I think the interesting thing to me is the tools are available for people and this is exactly what I did too, by the way, I started looking at my, this is about a decade, over a decade ago now, I started looking at like my life as a composer, if I wanted to do big Hollywood productions. And I, and I thought, like, I don't want to spend the next 10 years of my life grinding away at jobs that I really didn't enjoy doing, working for people that I probably didn't really like working with, being paid not even that much, just so that I had a shot at getting you know, up to a level where I could start making my own choices, right? Making like where I actually had some power, some negotiating power to say no to projects. And I looked at that and I thought, man, that sounds like a horrible way to live for a long period of time. So what I would rather do is make much smaller things, but I'm making them. They're, they're all mine and I get to make whatever I want. And, and if they make money, you keep the money as well. Yeah, sure. You know, um, and, and honestly, like a lot of what I get to do now, I, I get to do, it's, it's my decision, what we write, what I, what I write, it's nobody else is really writing these things, um, you know, what I say, um, you know, how they're produced, all of these things become my, my decision. And so even though I, like the career path I'm on now doesn't have a, you know, $30 million cap somewhere out there like it's got more of a you know two hundred thousand dollar cap somewhere right um i'm happier and i and i love what i get to do you know like i don't have to worry about you know whether or not i've impressed the right person or that like i've suddenly i've lost an opportunity with this studio because i said something at a party that I didn't mean to say or or on Twitter yeah. or on Twitter right or on Twitter or whatever like I I get to make what I want to make I'm way happier I make a decent living I don't have any complaints there either I have a house and a dog and I have space and I you know like all of these kinds of things and I think one of the things that it's also enabled me to do is is build I mean the the job I have now certainly with fee enabled me to build a team and build a creative team around the values that I have, which are like not killing people to do <laughs> good work. Hopefully everybody is inspired to do good work, but like I, I don't want anybody to feel the pressure to, you know, work until three o'clock in the morning every day. And uh, like, it just, you know. I think that's something you and I have in common is we actually do enjoy seeing people prosper. I mean, I think that's the entire point behind taking an interest in economics yeah. is I see a lot of people who are, they're miserable, they're broke, yeah. they complain about their mental illness all the time. Mm -hmm. And I look at how they conduct themselves. I look at their, their, uh, what they're motivated to do or not do, especially not do. And, um, you know, they, they seem to have this worldview that everybody should see things the way that they do. And I look and I'm going, but like, you're, you're making yourself miserable. Why do I want to live in a world that's yeah. kind of dictated by people who are making themselves miserable? Yeah, I like seeing prosperity. And I like, like you said, working, deciding what, what's the acceptable amount of weight you want to carry. Um, and what's the reward that you want for carrying that weight and then go do that. Because I find it, when people are individually free to choose what that is as a collective, you know, you get all these people who are, they become automatically specialists. And like you pointed out in out of frame mm -hmm. many times, our economy, our entire prosperous world is built on people being able to be specialists that yeah you know the equipment that we're working on at the moment is it, we were able to buy affordably because yeah. hundreds maybe thousands of specialists all mm -hmm. contributed a little bit of their their knowledge yeah. and value to collectively turning into the cameras and the lights and 
and that uh, sort it's, of thing. It's so ridiculously important. I, I can I can play that if I can point correctly. I can play that. I can't build it, mm-hmm. right? I have no idea how to how to do that. You know, and I can eat a ham sandwich. I I don't know how to raise pigs and slaughter right, them. You know. Right. You don't want me doing that, right? Like that's not, that wouldn't be a good use of my time or a good use of anybody else's time. I would do a terrible job. Uh, No instruments would be produced. No pigs would be raised uh, (laughs) uh, appropriately. It would all be very bad. Um, So it is, it's good to live in that kind of world. I, I think the interesting thing about the way that Hollywood is going is I do think you're, where I think you're really right is that I think that the, the promise of, we used to talk about the democratization of media and we used to talk about like 10, 15, 20 years ago, because people started seeing the technology become available and more widely available. But I think the difference is like, the technology is available now, the, uh, the knowledge is available, the knowledge of how to use that technology, um, YouTube, but you know, Skillshare, Khan Academy, you, you name it, whatever, like, you know, there are a million places to learn how to be a better cinematographer, how to be a better writer, how to be better. I mean, you even do little uh, test videos on Instagram and whatever of, of like, you know, tentacles and stuff yeah. for, for things like that, which people could learn from very easily. I, you know, you could learn all sorts of skills, makeup, you know. Um, That's my hope. Yeah. All mm-hmm. kinds of stuff. And so you, the tools are there, the knowledge is there, uh, available for you almost, you know, for free in many cases. And um, the question is, can you, and I, I mean this to the audience broadly, can you as an individual find a niche that allows you to make what you want to make, but which creates enough value for other people that you get paid for it and you get to make that consistently and keep doing it. And if you do that well enough, on your first few times out, do you get to expand that, right? Do you get to have a more consistent team? And now, now instead of just hiring your buddies, <laughs> you know, for a weekend or whatever, you're actually able to hire a, a small team of art, you know, artists and, and designers and whatever. Can you parlay that into something that's a little bit bigger? But then ask yourself the question, do you want to get so big that you lose control of the things that you enjoy? Or are you content enough to continue to make things at a, at a scale that's actually happy for you, you know, that, that actually makes you happy? I think that we, we're entering a world where that's possible. I don't think it's, it's, it's a, a world of pure hobbyists and, you know, multi-million dollar productions anymore. I think, I think there's a balance in, in between where you can probably make a decent living consistently producing stuff that you want to make. And I, we already see this with YouTube, right? But I think where, where it's going to get uh, more interesting is in the narrative side of things. Can you start making narratives and features and things like that, that actually get seen by people? The platforms are there, you know, like the platforms didn't exist before. Well, so, the platforms too are, are experiencing this as well, because it's major platforms and the smaller platforms. And when you go mm-hmm. to these smaller platforms, like, uh, was it Mubi or, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, this there's niches yeah. that are sustainable if you like you said if you don't want to if you're not particularly interested and i'm not interested in becoming a major major studio i want a small studio um yeah. you know and i do want to employ a few people but i want to keep it small enough where it's always within yeah. my control because i one of the reasons i left hollywood besides the money is Every time I had a project, it was like, as soon as somebody took an interest in it, as soon as you started talking about it, it wasn't that project anymore, which yep. was like your video about Mythic Quest on Apple TV, uh, which is one of my favorites, that Mythic Quest. One of my favorite, it was one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, I, I, I highly recommend that one. Maybe I'll leave a link to it in the comments as well. Um, but I think absolutely, you know, like I said, you can choose that level. The, the, yep. the, you know, the broader economic challenge that we face, not just in entertainment, but everywhere is that, you know, like you said, we're, we are currently seeing uh, government forces that mandate in favor of uh, larger companies which I, I don't have a problem with larger companies at all. As a matter of fact, you know, like I said, it's, I, I may have, disagreements or personal 
quibbles with how Jeff Bezos conducts himself. But overall, I think it's wonderful what Amazon has done for mm -hmm. my quality of life. I think it's wonderful that yeah. Captain Kirk actually got to go into space at 90 years cool. old. It's awesome. I William Shatner, like yeah. going from a guy driving around, sleeping in his car, doing plays to being 90 years old and swimming with sharks because he did that too um <laughs> and 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 going into space i mean i'm sure when he was sleeping in his car going from theater to theater he didn't think yeah. that that would ever be possible but that's the the magic of the free market and it's an incredible and, world man it, it is it's just absolutely incredible and it, for to not appreciate that is startling to me when i when i still when i see people like you were talking about people who are just bitter and just seem to have a chip on their shoulder about everything. And I, I just look around and see stuff like that and go, man, it's a world of opportunity. It is. And, and, and it's amazing. You know, like I said, I, I don't, I don't know how my phone works. I, I don't, I don't no understand idea. how I can make a piece of art with my daughter. I don't know if you can see that. Oh yeah, that's cool. And get it printed on my phone case and, yep. and shipped straight to my house. You know, it's like we, uh, uh, we can do anything. I posted that. I posted a picture of William Shatner after he was launched in space saying second start of the right straight on till morning. And my, nice. my post was we can do anything, you know? And I think that that's just like, you know, you see the up curve of the stock market. You can look, take sections of it and go, Oh, look, it took a sharp drop here, but over time mm -hmm. with technology, that's an up curve. I think yeah. we're just starting on that up curve and I and I want people to mm -hmm. appreciate it and and I'm so grateful that I get to uh, uh, you know have conversations with people like you who I learned so much from and 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 let me say honestly I am grateful for out of frame because it Thanks, came along at the right time it was exactly what I needed to hear and and put me on a path of of learning about this stuff so I could become a business person and find out that I actually do enjoy the business aspect of yeah. show business where before I thought, Oh, I'm just an artist. I'm com completely mm -hmm. hopelessly lost. So, um, but I, I think this is a good place to wrap it up. Cause I'm, I'm feeling a little verklempt. This is kind of a feel good moment. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and, yeah. And I want anybody who's watching, I want to thank as well and, and, and go like, I hope, I hope these conversations help. I hope you'll follow Sean and uh, V.org and out of frame because yep. they are, offering very valuable information that can help you and make your life better. I am currently also, uh, thanks to my producer, Doug Mayfield, uh, in November, I have an appointment with a um, uh, investment company that does some pro bono work that is going to help get me started learning how to invest in, in stocks, which cool. I should have been doing years ago. Uh, I feel that one, man. I am, I'm not good at that. I, t I typically leave that to my wife. She's much, much smarter about that stuff than me. Isn't it wonderful to be married to someone smarter than yourself? I, here's, I don't. Complimentary I, skills, man, in a, in a relationship are super valuable. I, I, I got to say this, you know, I think this is the other thing that I, a, a bit of advice I want people to, to kind of maybe think about is when I was young, I thought I was really smart. And now that I'm older, I think, I'm a I'm a, a fair average intelligence, uh, but I'm smart enough to ask questions and surround myself with people who know more than me, and that's done more for me than uh, any amount of super brain I could have hoped to have uh, would have. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that entirely makes sense, but no, it it does, man. It it doesn't matter. How, it also it doesn't matter how smart you are. Every every person on this planet has information you don't have. You know, exactly. Everybody. And again, this is this is what exchanges and negotiations and a free market is about. Uh, you know, people kind of look at it as this wicked, evil system designed to oppress you. And it's exactly the opposite. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like I see so many people convinced just to work against their own self-interest and they're otherwise good people. I don't hate them. I don't I don't despise them. I, I just I want to see them kind of uh, become more aware, more enlightened yeah. to just what they can gain uh, by taking a little initiative and, and learning a bit beyond what, you know, their, their Facebook feed or their Twitter feed tells them is reality. Yeah. So anyway, Sean, I want to thank you. Uh, hang on uh, after I stop the recording, just so I can uh, 
properly say goodbye, but I, I want to thank my audience and again recommend Out of Frame for fee.org on YouTube as well as the website. Um, and also check out Sean's uh, conversation with uh, Eric Wright. I am. Oh, yeah, Eric July. I, on Friday. Eric July. Sorry, why did I say right? Um, Eric July. Uh, I'll leave that in. I won't edit that out. I think. <laughs> uh, July is my birthday. I should remember that. Anyway, I'm looking forward to that as well. Um, so thank you so much for being on, Sean. This was, I find, a, a very enlightening and valuable conversation. Uh, and I hope you had some fun too. Yeah, thanks. All right. Hey everybody, I want to thank you once again for checking out my interview with the amazing Sean Malone of Fee.org. Again, if you go to the Fee YouTube channel, you can check out his show, Out of Frame, where he uses movies and pop cultures to talk about economics. I do think this is a really important subject to cover if you want to have some sort of viable career in the entertainment business, whether it be as a filmmaker or some other form of artist or musician. Uh, let me know what you think of this video. Do you want to see more economic discussions, more business discussions um, that, like with me, may aid you in figuring out how to turn your passion into a career. I think this is a very important topic to cover, but again, you're my audience. I know you like the tutorials and the commentaries, uh, as well as the interviews with other industry professionals. But I think, like I said, this is something that I really love covering. So let me know down in the comments and be sure to like and share this video if you think this is a good conversation to have, which I do. Uh, please share the video. I think that the more people who are economically aware, the better it's going to be for everyone. Because as you may have noticed, the economy ain't doing so good right now. The supply chains are kind of shot. And there are real world reasons for that that aren't being addressed because most people just don't take the time to learn a little bit about economics. And I feel if you know this, then you can navigate tough times like this and maybe even contribute, whether it be ideas or aspects of what you do that can help stimulate it. Uh, it's not all about the government stimulating it. It's about we, the people, because the economy is pretty much people. Anyway. That's all I'm going to say about this. Again, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Sean Malone. I hope to have him back on the show, as well as other people who may contribute to this conversation. And again, you please, as well, contribute to the conversation by leaving a comment. Uh, I want to thank you so much for supporting the channel. Let's help grow this thing. I want to get up to 1,000 subscribers before um, the winter time. hopefully. Let's see how successful this goes. Anyway. You guys all have a good one. Stay safe out there and keep creating.